Welcome back to another episode of Lost in the Farmer's Market Garden Shorts. And here we are, in the field, finally, with a specimen that consequently, having learned from my minor mistake involving sweet potatoes, I'm going to film this subject and talk about it before I turn it under. Now what you see before you is scientifically known as Tithonia rotundifolia. Some of you know what that means. This is Mexican sunflower. Now, Tithonia is an interesting name because it comes from the name Tithonus, a man loved by Aurora, the dawn goddess in Greek mythology. Rotundifolia is a reference to the rounded shape of the leaves, which as you can see, they're kind of um, heart-shaped. I'm going to zoom in just a little bit for your benefit there. See what I mean? See what I mean, jelly bean? Yeah, yeah. Look at that. Those are some pretty flowers. And this variety is, I believe, gold finger, if not orange torch. You know, look, I mean, look at that flower. And of course, since it is in the Aster family, it attracts pollinators and thing busters. If it were just a little bit sunnier, you would see this thing vibrating with honeybees. Well, not honeybees, bumblebees. Even though monarch butterflies and hummingbirds come and visit this plant. So it's a win on all fronts. I'm going to zoom out again. Now, as I said, it's from Asteraceae, which means the daisy family, which means it's related to marigold, rudbeckia, uh, coneflower, all that. It's even related to the common dandelion. It's actually stevia, the sweetener herb that we love so much, is in the aster family. I mean, traditional sunflowers are also in the aster family, but the aster family is massive. So this is in good company. It is invasive in parts of Africa, unfortunately, and here we're just a bit too cold for its seeds to theoretically survive the winter, though this is a volunteer, probably because I put down mulch it made it through the winter. It produces a lot of seed. So if you're in zone 9A or warmer, you might want to watch, you might want to do some deadheading and watch that. Now, this plant originates in Mexico and Central America, hence the name Mexican sunflower. It is hardy up to zone 9A, but it's annual anywhere colder, which is how I treat it here in zone 8A. But sometimes the seeds don't read the book and do the do. The soil pH it prefers is 5.8 to 6.5, and its preferred exposure is full sun, and it can take southern laser sun. So, gotta love it. It also doesn't mind dry soil. Um, it can largely take care of itself, though, as you can see, it's growing in my vegetable patch. Um, and it's in the way of the fall crops, so I have to turn it under, but it's still a gorgeous plant anyway. Um, this got water, so this one individual plant was very strong. It's crooked. I'm going to move the thing so you can see. See how crooked that stem is? That's because it was tangled up in the cowpea trellis I had here that got knocked over by a hurricane and bent this plant, too. In fact, if I, I'm going to zoom in just a little bit. I don't know if you can see that real well, but there, inside, you can see where the original central leader snapped off while I was trying to clean that me Oh, hey. Hey. Did y'all see that? A actual bumblebee flew up onto that flower and was just like, mmm, time to get my pollen. Bow, bow, bow. Whatever. Now, the height of this plant can be four to six feet tall. However, I've had specimens reach eight. If you, I mean, it's amazing and awesome. Um, the width is two to three feet. Again, I've had them reach four, four feet in diameter. They're roughly uh, triangular shaped is the best way to describe it. They're usually not shaped like th this particular specimen, but you get the point. Now, it has an alternate name, and that is red sunflower. And I think you can see why looking at that outrageously fire orange it is. Because it, it comes in reds and all shades of orange. It is a sunflower that does well here in the southeast. Traditional sunflowers tend to get eaten. Like the rabbits come in and eat the lawnmower. Um, the squirrels will eat them, especially when they're young. But, when, but this doesn't have any problems, except when they're really young, they might have some slug problems, but they usually outgrow that. And it also has to be an exceptionally wet year. So slugs and snails can be a problem, but not, not really, right? Now, um, it blooms from July through September, and the flowers are three inches across, which, as you can see in that specimen there in the low middle right, um, it checks. 
Definitely. And there are plenty of flowers. It's not, I do one flower and I'm done. It's constant bloom action. So it's a constant provider of pollen and nectar for various critters. It's a win for your garden. Now, uh, let's see what else. Now, according to my research, the leaves and the flowers are edible. Now, I have not tried this, but it is an aster, so how dangerous could it be? I mean, that's just asking trouble, am I right? But supposedly, the leaves and the flowers are edible, and you can use them as garnish and salads and all kinds of stuff. I would recommend doing the allergy test with them first before you try that, and also research this thoroughly to make sure there isn't any preparation. I did a quick glance, and this was agreed upon on several sites, and I'm going to move the camera, because one of our lovely bumblebees is, oh yeah, hmm, hey there, muscly leg bumblebee, you come to get the pollen, yeah, yeah, I have a dirty mind, what can I say, anyway, it's apparently used as a medicine in parts of Venezuela, I've only heard that mentioned in one or two places, so I cannot confirm or deny if you're going to use it as a medicine, as I always say, check and verify. Consult a properly credential practitioner, a uh, doctor or otherwise, and verify that it's right for you and that it's safe. There are certain plants that have killed you dead toxins in them, and I really don't want any of you lovely people pushing up daisies in the wrong possible way. As a last note, I found that these plants can be grown as a green manure. Now that's a concept that's relatively unspoken in the field. Green manure is any plant material that you plant with the intention of turning it under, tilling it under, or mowing it, or doing something to it, ending its life, but allowing its bits to fertilize the soil. Oh yeah, look at that bubble bee just going at it. Mm. Now before any of you say that's a carpenter bee, that is a bumblebee. If you notice the banded furry abdomen, that's how you know. And I've been getting bumblebees this year. Real bumblebees, not the carpenter bees, not those schmucks. The real deal, and it's awesome. Also, these little guys, or girls I should say, are solitary, give or take. And um, they've been loving the snapdragons I put in. I mean, they love everything I put in because it's easy food for them, but... They love the snapdragons, which we will do a video on soon. Anyway, green manure. So, it's a plant that's grown for its greens. It's ground up or turned under, and it feeds the soil. So, winter rye, um, red or white clover, and apparently Mexican sunflowers. I guess you till them under before they get a foot tall and get a little woody. I don't know. But, I've seen it on multiple sites, and it must be, it, it could probably be useful. Seeing as how this plant grows just about anywhere, that can be very useful if for subsistence farming to turn it under to feed the soil without having to buy chemical fertilizers. But that's about all I have for you on Mexican sunflower. I hope you found this video informative. Um, for once, I didn't screw up and till the plant under before I had to talk about it. There will be more stuff coming, winter annuals and things like that. So uh, stay tuned, hit the like, hit that subscribe bell thingy, um, hit up the blog. Leave your comments if you want to hear or see anything, and as always, folks, keep them growing. Thank you.